Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Burks, and I'm going to talk about how we can bring one of the advantages of gRPC to REST APIs. Uh, gRPC is a framework for building APIs, and in gRPC, um, there's a language for describing an API. And from that language, uh, you use a tool called the Protocol Buffer Compiler to compile that description, and that's passed to plugins that generate code in various languages to support the API. That's the kind of code that's usually written by hand for REST APIs, either written by hand by an application developer or maybe by a service provider that wants to help application developers by giving them an SDK to use the service. Um, but it's hard to write good SDKs. Um, if you're focused on building good services, you might not know the environment where your client library is going to be used. You might not know that very well. You might not even know the language that you want to write your client libraries in. And then you have to watch out for conflicts between the SDA that you create and the other SDKs that your users are going to bring into their applications. Now, this isn't a problem with gRPC. So with gRPC, an app developer doesn't get SDKs from all the vendors that provide services for that app. Instead, with gRPC, you can collect the service descriptions of all the gRPC APIs that you want to use and generate a single combined client library or SDK that calls all of them. Now, the Open API Initiative is um, behind a new standard called the Open API Standard that's used to describe REST APIs. And uh, from that standard, there are a number of tools that uh, work with the description and do things like um, generating documentation or providing API services. And they also generate code like the kinds of client libraries that I just mentioned. But some of these tools, actually most of them are pretty new, and the code that they generate um, could be better. And it's, it could be better because the users, the desired users of this code, they're really not that engaged with the code generators that are making the code. So you might find one of these code generators online. You might find one that generates client libraries for dozens of different languages. And as you look at it, you see that it supports your language. So you decide to use it to generate a client library for an API that you want to use. Um, but what happens if you need to fix something in that generated code? Well, you could manually fix it, but if you do that, you might as well write your own client library by hand. Why bother? Um, if you want to fix the code generator, and it's in a, if it's in a language that you're not familiar with, then, well, you have to get the source code first, and then you look at the language, and you see, yeah, I don't use that language. So then you have to probably download some new tools, maybe a runtime or a virtual machine. And then you have to figure out a build system. And then you build the code, and you wait while the code generator and all of those dozens of other code generators that you don't use build. And when that finally finishes, then you can iterate a while, until hopefully you fix the problem and you have good code. But then, what if you want to submit that change back to the main project? Well, you could, you could set up a, a pull request and hope that it gets accepted, um, you know, send it up. But, but maybe you made a change that you don't want to make public or share. Or maybe the, maybe the maintainers don't like your pull request. So then what do you do? If you fork the project, you've actually forked everything. You've not just forked the part you fixed, but you forked the core code generator, and you forked all those other languages. And you can't really put a version number on the change that you just made, because the versioning of the code generator applies to the whole thing, all the dozens of other languages that, that are lumped into the thing. 
So this isn't a problem for gRPC. So with gRPC, the code generation process starts with a kind of a general purpose compiler called Proto-C. It reads the protocol buffer definition language, and it uses a plugin interface to call plugins that generate code in lots of different languages. It uses a, a special binary format. It's actually a protocol buffer that it uses to define that format. And then the, the plugins can be written in any language that supports protocol buffers or that has protocol buffer support. So the result of that is that the Go plugin for gRBC is written in Go. And if you're a Go user and you don't like the code that comes out of it, you can easily fix that. So last year, I started working on some tools to work with OpenAPI. And OpenAPI is usually represented with JSON or YAML. And those things, those formats are typically read into dynamic languages, into dynamic data structures. And in Go, that's not so great. We'd really like to have some strongly typed representations. So as I was thinking about how to make these, one of my coworkers suggested that <clears throat> I look at protocol buffers and create a protocol buffer representation of OpenAPI and then read JSON or YAML into that protocol buffer representation in which I would be able to generate the data structures in lots of different languages, including Go. I accidentally found out that um, the protocol buffer representations are really fast. Uh, Kubernetes has a big API. The open API description for the Kubernetes API is one and a half megabytes of JSON. And that takes about a half second to read into a Go data structure. So a Kubernetes engineer took my tool, used it to convert the Kubernetes JSON into a proto version, and found that he could import that. He could read that in nine milliseconds. So big difference there. But the thing that really matters to me most is that the protocol buffer representation makes it easy to build plugins. So it's easy to write code generator plugins that use the proto version of OpenAPI, which is already syntax, error checked, pre-processed, to build code generators in lots of different languages. So I believe that the only way to make a code generator that generates code that is good enough for people to actually want to use is for the, for the developer of that to understand that code generators belong to their communities. That if we're generating code, we need to do that in, in those languages. So that's the purpose of Gnostic, which is, which is my tool. This is um, a Go program. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's open source, Apache licensed. And the project right now includes a binary that's the, a command line tool that's the core processor. It has a number of demos and plugins. And it has models built into it for OpenAPI 2, which is kind of this, it's the standard OpenAPI right now. And also, a, a, a draft of OpenAPI 3, which is getting close to completion. Um, and I'm hoping to continue working on this and to work with people in lots of different language communities to, uh, to, to go forward with this. So if you're interested in helping, here are some ways that you could get involved. It's on GitHub at googleapis.gnostic or slash Gnostic. And I'm Tim Burks on um, Twitter, Gmail, and at google.com. Thank you.